Let's bow our heads. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much once again for this incredible opportunity, this privilege to gather together as family in the unity of the faith, Father. Thank you for making us victorious as a function of said faith, Father. Thank you for your spirits baptizing us into union with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a tremendous miracle that is. May we never become familiar with it, but rather rejoice in it each and every day, understanding our new lot in life as evangelists with the Great Commission in hand. Father, we pray for those that are still ill in the congregation. Our hearts and our spirit go out to them. And we ask for your healing power in their lives, whatever that may mean as individuals. Father, we pray also for those that are still lost in this world, that your patience continue, and that at some point they repent and come to saving faith. And if we happen to be in that path, that would be wonderful, Father. We'd be so grateful for that opportunity as well. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on the cross to make a morning like this even a reality. We do just ask for your blessings on this morning's message. May it be edifying for our souls. <clears throat> we ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Again, uh, what is repentance? I'm just going to have to be um, sort of low-key this morning. Um, what is repentance and who gets to define it? Part 26. Uh, this past week was filled with uh, some wonderful perspective, uh, beginning with this. This came up on Tuesday evening. I shared it on Thursday as well in terms of simple things or just the concept of simplicity God's plan for salvation is as simple as a little child running to his father to save him. And that's a wonderful visual of what actually happens. God's plan for salvation is as simple as a little child running to his father to save him. Such a wonderful perspective and so very simple. And... The question is, why aren't we presenting the good news like this more often? It doesn't mean you have to compromise the perfect integrity of God, the justice of God, the sovereignty of God. It doesn't mean you have to accommodate man's so-called sensibilities to present it this way. But to a humble person, this is going to mean everything to them because this is what they've been waiting for. Salvation so the question is, why aren't we presenting the good news like this more often? We're either messing up the simplicity of it, redefining things in order to suit our personal sensibilities, or we're not representing our sovereign Lord in heaven properly. Mankind is really good at disrespecting the holy God of the universe and then expecting him to accommodate them. Like a almost like a adolescent. We're just disrespectful as beings. And then we expect the sovereign God of the universe to accommodate us, to bend to our will. And in the case of salvation proper, of course, that means eternity in the lake of fire. But we believers also understand that we struggle with the flesh and we can lose sight of why we're even here and why God has left us here. And we lose sight of our purpose and we get self-absorbed sometimes. And when that happens, all kinds of chaos uh, ensues in our lives. <clears throat> our job, as the Spirit's been driving home for some time now, is to partake in this great commission. One of the ways is to do what you're doing right now. Learn. Learn. I mean, that's what Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 is. You're supposed to be equi equipped for the work of service. Your service is to go out with the Great Commission. And you have to be equipped, though. You have to be built up. You have to be, even in your own way, encouraged. And I do hope that these lessons are encouraging 
uh, each and every time. This is sort of a refueling stop. This is not the end game. This is just uh, a fob, if you would use military terms, you know what I mean? A place where you come back, you refuel, you get some more ammo, you learn some more uh, tricks of the trade, so to speak, and then you go back out and do your thing. And so you're actually doing, you're actually participating in the Great Commission right now by just learning. So we've been given a balance statement up here on the board. We are not strictly evangelizing every moment of every day. Rather, our direction is set and it points to eternal life, inviting and encouraging others to join us in our joy. We're not necessarily, you know, giving somebody the gospel proper every moment of every day, uh, and we're not defunct in the Great Commission if we're not doing that every moment of every day. Doing what you're doing right now is actually satisfying God's demands on the Great Commission. Because you have to learn these things. This is what we, he gave us the Bible for. You have to learn. You have to grow. <clears throat> I was reflecting on this. You may be called to exist in some far corner of the earth someday. And there's only, let's say, one other person within an earshot of you. And your job, for the sake of evangelism, is to just show up. I mean, if it's you and one other person and God puts you there to evangelize this person, your job is to just show up. Never underestimate your impact in this world. That is what God can and will do with your life for the sake of others to His glory. Every single person in here I'm looking at, every, I know something about every one of you, And in your own way, I'm sure of it, um, you've had an impact in a righteous way in this world. And it's unique, at least from my perspective. It's unique, and that's a wonderful thing. So never underestimate your impact in this world, because God will use your life. There's a reason why you're here. Uh, you have a purpose. It's to His glory, but it's for the sake of others. And that's that humility side that the Spirit's been teaching us. And that's why we learn. Because we don't come popping out of the womb, not to be weird, but with humility. We're arrogant. We're completely self-centered, egocentric, little, cute, nice smelling, but egocentric little you know what. I was thinking about, I, was, I recall a while back a time when uh, uh, Michael Pavia reminded me of something that had come from the pulpit years ago. And because he remembered it, I was both encouraged uh, knowing God used me somehow to edify him. And I was also reminded of the principle itself. He remembered me saying, I had forgotten I said it, but it stuck with me after the fact. Isn't that strange? I'm the one who said it. It stuck with him. He said it back to me and now it stuck with me. Do you understand the dynamic? That's how it goes sometimes. I don't remember half the stuff I've said in the past. How could I? Honestly. Sometimes some people, some people say something back, and I'm like, yeah, that was pretty, that's a nice way to say it. And I actually said that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's the spirit. But you know what I mean. Anyways, he remembered me saying something like, if God said stand in front of that tree over there and preach the gospel then you ought to do it. For there might be someone up in that tree on that day, and you don't even know it. How do you know what's going on behind the scenes? How do you know? You don't have eyes in the back of your head, right? You don't understand who's hearing your, who's seeing your witness, who's hearing your witness, who's observing you. You don't know. There's 360 degrees in this world, and we can only pretty much see like this, right? You never know. Our job as soldiers for Christ is to obey. I know, it's such a... People are like, oh, here we go. Obey. It's beautiful. 
being able to obey means you actually have a purpose. That's half the problem in this world. Children nowadays are being brought up, they don't even know what to obey because nobody's given them any direction. And all it does is breed insecurity and anxiety and depression and everything else because they've got nothing and nobody to obey. So obedience is really a gift. I'm going to give you something to orient to. I'm going to give you commands to obey. And when you do, you're going to be blessed for it. But that's not how a brat thinks, is it? That's not how adolescents think, is it? Certainly not the flesh. But nonetheless, our job as soldiers for Christ is to obey True obedience doesn't require absolute knowledge of why our Master asks us to do something. For all you know, like Job, you may be even entertaining angels unaware. You have no idea. Go to 1 Peter 1.10. 1 Peter 1, verse 10. You have no idea who you are entertaining, who is watching you. 1 Peter 1.10. Verse 10, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. In these things which now have been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Huh. So when someone's preaching the gospel, the angels are watching, you bet. And it brings glory to God. You have no idea your impact in this world. And it's not about, I've been having a few conversations this week, it's not about you trying to be all slick and snazzy and using fancy words and you trying to argue with people that you may love, say family members. And try to, you know, shake them into understanding and accepting the gospel. That's not your job. Man doesn't sanctify man. Your job is to present the truth. The truth about our Lord and Savior. The truth about His own ministry even. The truth about His gospel. That's your job, to keep it accurate. And when you do that, you realize that all the weight of this great commission is on His shoulders, not yours. As long as you always go back to the Word of God, all pressure's off. You just say, this is what the Word says. And you, you're you relieved of those, you know, that, that anguish you might feel of trying to evangelize somebody that you really care about, let's say, who's stuck in some religion or something like that. You're relieved because you have to have faith that God the Holy Spirit can change that person just like he changed you. But you are not going to change that person. Verse 13, things which, into which angels long to look, therefore prepare your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As what? Obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Again, the point up on the board is that our job as soldiers for Christ is to obey. It's to obey. Look at verse 17. If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Again, our job as soldiers for Christ is to obey. 
Go to 1 John 5, 1. 1 John 5, 1. A humble person says, great, I have marching orders. Great, I actually have purpose. Great, thank you for giving me something to rest my life on. Thank you, Lord. 1 John 5, 1. <clears throat> An arrogant person bucks it. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. That's true obedience. Uh, this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. One of the ways that you know that you've been saved even. That you have a desire to obey. If you have no desire to obey, you don't love God. Something's missing in your so-called salvation. Because God changes you. The new creature, all the new creature wants to do is obey God. Worship God, even. If that's non-existent in a person, something's wrong. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. That's what true obedience looks like. And His commandments are not burdensome. That's what the Spirit's been saying. It's a change of perspective. An unbeliever looks at the Bible and goes, wow, those are a lot of, like, you know, commands, huh? A believer is like, thank God for all these commands. Because if these commands weren't here, I'd have to choose on my own, and you know how I choose. My success rate is really bad. <laughs> so his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Again, our job as soldiers for Christ is to obey. Up here on the board, just a little more perspective on that. Obedience fosters a joy for serving, especially the Lord but also our Lord's sheep, our brothers and sisters in Christ. If you were to read other portions of First John, that's what you'd see. That that's our desire as children of God, as changed individuals. We have a desire to serve, especially the Lord. And that's what you're doing right now by learning His Word. That's a form of service. But also others. And as you know, most of you will attest as you grow in the grace and knowledge of God, you experientially want to serve others more. And you realize it, if you look even back five, ten years in your life, you're like, man, I was a selfish brat over here. Maybe I was saved, but I was a young infant in Christ, and I was really selfish compared to now. Now I just want to get out there and serve others, find ways I can serve others. And that's what it means to grow up in the grace and knowledge of God. So that's the key, you see, as the Spirit brought out last week. True humility means serving others. And if we were to synthesize a little bit up here on the board, <clears throat> the blessing of humility, with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves, Philippians 2.3, we might take that as, oh, you know, a fundamental definition of humility. With humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. We also have from Acts 20, 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus said that. So you have these two key principles. If we synthesize just these two basic doctrines, we inevitably arrive at the title. There are blessings associated with humility, with serving others. We might even say that if we want to be graced out with blessings, we must be humble. And if the litmus test for humility is living for others then the inescapable fact is that blessings are bestowed upon those who live for others. That's a really fundamental lesson that I think is one of the hardest ones that most even believers face. They, they have to toss out the idea, the old idea, that if you live for yourself, your life improves. That's a lie. That's a lie from the kingdom of darkness. You might say, no, it's not. Because I can go to the packy and pick up a six-pack, drink them back, and I'm feeling pretty darn good. That's not a blessing. That's a Band-Aid. That's you masking something else. That's not a blessing. Living for yourself is not a blessing. 
That is a curse. It is even you forming a judgment on yourself. And that's what we learn. And that's how we know what true humility looks like. Because an arrogant person always lives for themselves. They may be really, you know, manipulative and sort of um, smooth and mask it. And, oh, I'm totally living for others. And why do you get a trumpet? Why are you on the street corner? Why, why don't I just live for others instead of telling everybody about how you're living for others? Your motivation is terrible. You're not living for others. It's just another way that you're living for yourself. Because you're the one getting all the credit. And you're trying to gather all the glory as unto you. And that's what an infant in Christ might try to do. They make all these plans and, you know, things. They, they do all these things and like, oh, I'll, you know, I'll be this, I'll be that. And they're really just living for themselves. And that's not humility at all. Up here on the board, <clears throat> on lacking humility, unfortunately, many so-called Christian churches are designed to glorify individuals who walk through the doors, with that being the end of the, the ministry. Like, yay, you're so awesome, you came to church. Like, that's the end goal. That's not the end goal. And people are praised for simply doing as they ought to do. Go to Luke 17, 7. People are praised for simply doing as they ought to do. And, you know, Jesus had something to say about that. He didn't like it, frankly. Luke 17, verse 7. Which of you, having a slave, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come immediately and sit down to eat? But will he not say to him, Prepare something for me to eat? and properly clothe yourself, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you may eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. That's the right perspective. But that's not the perspective that's actually taught in the average Christian church. I mean, you're supposed to, if the, you know, if God calls you to a church, you're supposed to come to the church. <laughs> That's why it's here. It's just like, what the heck? You're supposed to come. There's no glory in you coming to church and actually doing what God has set apart by grace for you. There's no glory in that. I mean, you're supposed to be here. It doesn't make any sense otherwise. But people are like, ah, oh, but I made it to church. So what? That's people. So there's a skewed perspective that the Spirit's trying to ferret out in our studies. He's just trying to protect you from it. Those who obey the commands of the Lord ought not think that their obedience is meritorious, worthy of praise. Yet many so-called, quote, Christian churches nowadays bait the human flesh with such praise. Come to our church. Yeah, yeah you go to that bald guy on the hill. You're going to walk out of there with your tail between your legs. He's unrelenting. Right? Oh, don't go to him. Because he just, you know, he's unrelenting. And it's not even me, it's the spirit, right? Come to us. We'll play a little music. We'll pat each other on the back. We'll even have singles night. So you can find someone. <sighs> he's so awesome. He looks so good today. God saves us not only because He loves us, but because He desires to glorify Himself. He wants to glorify Himself. So concentrate is a, a moment of concentration in our lesson here. On Thursday, the Spirit pointed out that though it seems gracious and loving to tell someone they are worthy to be glorified. I mean, who doesn't want to hear that, right? You know what I'm getting at? Oh, you're, 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 you're a stud. You're awesome. You're, oh, you go, girl. You're so awesome. Right? And everybody's like, Phew. I am. I'm pretty awesome, right? And everybody's like, yeah, you're so awesome, right? So it seems gracious and loving. 
to tell someone they are worthy to be glorified, but it is actually an insidious trap. It's an insidious trap. The world says, derive your self-esteem from yourself. The Bible says, derive your self-esteem from Jesus Christ. Those are diametrically opposed things. The world says, oh, you go girl, you go guy, you got this, I'm with you 100%. It's a trap. And we eat it up because we like the praise. Satan's not stupid. Remember, his speech is smooth as butter. Unlike mine most days, right? Mine's like, it's jagged, it's like sandpaper. Oh, God. Satan, smooth as butter. It's an insidious trap. Let me explain. A person who is taught that they must be glorified in time, particularly by themselves, when they look in the mirror, or by others, is being set up for persistent failure. A person who has that instilled in them, you should be glorified. And if, if you're not being glorified, if you or someone else can't glorify you, something's wrong. You're coming up short. A little perspective up here on the board. When you look in the mirror, the glory you ought to be looking for is Christ in you, not whatever it is you've made of yourself. The prior is godly sanctification. The latter is worldly. When you look in the mirror, and I'm talking figuratively, obviously, when you do some soul searching, you are not to be looking for what it is that you've made of yourself. You're looking for Christ in you. That's the very best part of you. Anything that your flesh has concocted or anything that the world seems to esteem, it's, it's dangerous ground. If the world esteems something in you, something's wrong. Because the world likes its own. Jesus Christ said that. If you're of the world, it loves its own. Didn't he say that? So they're always, the world's always going to build you up. In all the wrong ways. How'd you get a new promotion? You go, girl. You go, guy. You are the woman. You are the man. It happens in families. It especially happens in schools. I mean, the garbage that's being taught in schools nowadays is so d ridiculous and so perverse. It's hard to imagine. But everybody's chewing it up. A believer who looks in the mirror and is ever disappointed is missing the point and has been lied to. So let me, let me give you this here. Some more perspective. The greatest mirror we've ever been given is the Word of God. Yeah. You don't turn on the television to find out how you compare. You don't read Reddit. You don't watch YouTube. You don't go... You get what I'm getting at? If you want to know about you from your Creator... Here's where you go. This is where you go. But nobody's going there anymore. That's the problem. And no one's taking their children there anymore. That's the problem. The great, so nobody knows who they are. Do you understand? Nobody has any purpose. Nobody even knows who or what to obey. Because they've got no marching orders. So there's a huge vacuum in their soul. And what happens when there's a vacuum? Anything will get sucked in. And Satan's like, sure, I'll, I'll throw a few ungodly doctrines in there. I'll, few, I'll throw a few bad ideas in there. I'll tell you a great along the way. So he asks for double portions. The greatest mirror we've ever been given is the Word of God. I, I'm convinced of this. And I know this happens with you as well. This is why some people don't read the Word of God. Because they're afraid what they'll find. And they don't want to read it because they're afraid what they'll find. They don't want to look in the mirror because they're afraid what they'll see. The truth about them. Because God doesn't hold back. And when God the Holy Spirit's right there with you, convicting you, it might be painful. 
But nonetheless, the greatest mirror we've ever been given is the Word of God. If a person really desires to find out about themselves, God's purpose for them, etc., they simply need to read their Bible. Sadly, though, instead of introducing our children to Jesus Christ, we Americans saddle them with ungodly expectations. Instead of introducing our children to Jesus Christ, we Americans saddle them with ungodly expectations. You have to be glorified or else you've failed. We sell them the, you know, the so-called American dream. I wrote a blog on that once, said it was a farce. I still believe that. American dream is a joke. It's a farce. It's a trap set by the kingdom of darkness. Some of you are like, really? Yeah, really. We sell them the American dream and then scoff at them when they never achieve it. Or we torture those who supposedly do make it because we're jealous. Wrong playing field. The whole thing's a farce. Nothing wrong with owning a house or having a dog. That's not what I'm saying. But that's not your purpose in this life. So-called, quote, success these days is a loaded gun for both parties, the successful and the observers. So, frankly, much of what we see in our society today is a bunch of disappointed people. <laughs> That's what we see. We see a bunch of disappointed people. That's basically what, and it's perpetual. And you know what that leads to? The D word. Depression. If you're perpetually disappointed in your life, what do you think you're going to end up in? What a state do you think you're going to end up in? We call it depression. You can call it whatever you want. But that's a technical term for it. Depression. So here's the net net of what the Spirit's been getting at as of late. And I hope you take this the right way. Chances are, if you're depressed, you're too focused on yourself. One of the greatest fruits of self-absorption is depression. Chances are, I'm not saying in every case I'm not God. Maybe you, have, maybe you really do have some kind of chemical imbalance or something. I don't know. Maybe it's a medical, I don't know. But I think there's a lot of lying going on in medicine. I think, I don't know what the percentages are, but I think there's a lot of people out there that are depressed because they don't have Christ. That's what it comes down to. It's not because they didn't, you know, you know, it's like, oh, get back in the saddle, sweetie. Get back in the saddle. Lose that 300 pounds, and then you can be someone. Because that's the problem. That's your problem. You're overweight. Get that toupee, mister. Here's a little Rogaine. How about some plugs? You're bald. You don't measure up. You're short. You're ugly. You stink. You don't get it. What the heck? Well, all we do is get we just judge, and then we buy a lie and we judge ourselves. And God's like, what are we doing? Why are you so depressed? I made you exactly the way I wanted to make you. I didn't screw up. I made you. I didn't screw up. Yeah, that wart that's like right here in the middle of your head that everybody talks about. I gave it to you. Because you're although if you didn't have it, you were too darn arrogant. I had to settle you down there, Spike. Right? <laughs> Because you've been way too arrogant without the mole or the wart, whatever it is. It's growing off your head. Right? You know what I'm saying? God doesn't make any mistakes. So what are you so depressed about? Either he's a, an evil God that just really says, I'm going to create this one really bad. And, you know. No, God, God saved you. God has delivered you, especially believers, right? He's, he's not interested in you being beaten down and depressed. But he does tell us in the Bible, listen, if you just focus on yourself all the time, you know what? You're not blessed. We just saw that with humility, with the baseline definition of humility. If you're not humble, if you're not laying down your life for others, if you're not living in the Great Commission, if, if these things don't line up, then you don't get the blessings. But, 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 
The world has given me all this stuff that tell me I'm like an amazing human being. Yeah, that's what the God of the world is good at, lying to you, because you're not amazing without Christ. Just consider the U.S. alone with its horrendously idolatrous culture. It's not even a little idolatrous. Let's just face it. Turn on the TV, what do you see? The so-called very best of everything. Right? When's the last time, except for like a, um, I don't know, a specific kind of commercial? When's the last time you saw like ugly people in commercials? Oh, uh, let's face it. How often do you go into a trauma center and everybody's beautiful? <laughs> right? I mean, come on. Is anybody doing any medicine here? Is everybody just hey, you hook it up? It's ridiculous. But that's our baseline. That's what we're selling our kids. Oh, shut up, shut up. It's 50 bucks for a new Grand Theft Auto. And if you're done with that, go ahead and watch uh, St. Elsewhere reruns. Of, I don't know. Is that even a show? That was like a doctor show, right? I don't know. General Hospital. Whatever. I'm old, right? Here, learn your doctrines from these things, from these people, because I'm too busy and I'm too obnoxious and I'm too depressed myself to get out of bed and actually train you up and parent you because I'm too self-absorbed myself. So let's keep this dysfunction junction going, shall we? You know what I'm getting at you? All because of why? Because of self-focus, because people are told early on in their lives that it was about them and they've never let it go. It, it lingers. Focus on self, focus on self. Make yourself better, make a better life, make this better, make that better. You do it, you do it, you do it. No. Pick up the mirror, find out what God's purpose is for you, and then pray on it and see what he does with you. And it may take you a while because most of you are really arrogant. It may take a while for you to be delivered because you're, you're that arrogant. Oh, no, I'm like the oh shucks guy. Yeah, I know. I call that covert arrogance. I wrote a book on it. I'm just saying, chances are, if you're depressed, you're too focused on yourself. One of the greatest fruits of self-absorption is depression. Again, consider the U.S. and its horrendous idolatry up here on the board. We have almost a 7% depression rate in America. What? 7%? 7 out of 100 people are clinically depressed as of NIMH? <clears throat> That's unbelievable. It's probably going to increase because this country is running away from Jesus. So I was concentrating. Keep concentrating. You know, why all the depression? And I'm not saying I have all the answers, my friends. I know what the Bible says. I know why people would be depressed. I'm not even sure how people live without Christ nowadays, but that's a whole other topic. Why all the depression? If someone tells a young child that the only way they'll ever find true peace and contentment is to make it for themselves, they have essentially crippled that person for life, possibly, and lied to them about God. You want to set some, someone up for a life of depression? Tell them that. Make it. Go out there and strive with the rest of the uh, unbelievers out there, with the world. It's a joke. Meanwhile, the Lord is our great physician. While there's no shortage of so-called remedies for mental distress in this world, there's only one final authority on the topic, and that is God. That is God. God's the one. Look, there is no pill. You ready? I know people like to say, oh, it's a miracle pill. No, it's not. There is no pill that's a miracle pill. God does miracles. Pills don't do miracles. Counselors don't do miracles. Pastors don't do miracles. God does miracles. I'm not saying there's not certain drugs and this kind of thing, so don't get all up in arms with me. I hope you see what the Spirit's trying to say to you. There's a problem of epidemic proportions in our country, and it's because we're running away from Christ. And depression is an obvious fruit of that thing. Because nobody has purpose anymore. Nobody has direction. Nobody has anything to obey. 
and to orient to. It's, it's the goldfish analogy, right? I don't know, if, is this actually true? Like if you just keep feeding a goldfish, it'll eat so much it'll blow up and die? Is that true? Does anybody know? All right, go with it. If you, if you feed a goldfish, you keep feeding it, it dies. It just eats too much. That's how we are. We don't have any self-control. Somebody needs to say, stop eating that much fish food. And that's, again, right here. Well, how big is my stomach? How, what's my appetite for certain things? Well, this is where you find it. What's my appetite for this? What's my appetite for that? What am I prepared for this? What will God give me that? We saw this on Thursday. Is God now alternative medicine? God has become a last resort of sorts, not a first consult as our great physician. God has become a last resort of sorts, not a first consult as our great physician. It's almost like medicine has taken over. Pharmaceuticals who drive medicine, like little slaves, has taken over and said, we'll give you all these pills for us, and if all this fails, I guess you can't go for spiritual. Oh, well, that's backwards. No, 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 that's totally backwards. You don't pop pills first. You go to the Lord. You go to God first. What's going on in my life? Well, for starters, up here on the board, there are a lot of people living a lie in a religion that makes room for self, that glorifies self. They want the grace without the truth, you see. They want all the goodies. Give me the goodies, but I don't want that other stuff. I want you to lie to me. Yet Jesus himself is described as full of grace and truth. These people don't want Jesus. Why? Because he's Lord, but they want to be Lord. They want to be Lord of their own lives. They want to be the ones to sanctify themselves. So they don't want another Lord. They want his salvation because that's a good thing, right? I get into heaven. But they don't want him. James spoke about true religion in its base form. Go to James 1.26. James 1.26. <clears throat> I hope you see what the Spirit's trying to say here. I hope nobody's stumbling either. I, I apologize. I'm not trying to uh, judge anybody for um, anything that they do or, you know, what have you. <clears throat> I'm just presenting what the Bible has to say on peace and contentment and where you get it from. And if you don't have it, chances are you're missing something. And it's not a pill. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not a remedy from the world. The remedies are not from the world. James 1.26 If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. That's pretty direct language. Probably not so popular, but that's what true religion looks like. Keep concentrating. As a believer, ask yourself how difficult it is to make something dead. Get up, pour a cup of coffee, go to work, make some money, come home, say your hellos, feed the family, etc. As a believer, ask yourself how difficult it is to make something dead. Get up and do all those things. All with a joy set before you. How's that going to work? How does something dead, first of all, do any of that? And then you want to pop on the, with a joy set before it? How's that going to happen? How can we ever expect something dead to do all of this stuff? Aren't we setting ourselves up for disappointment? Aren't we asking a little too much of something dead? Aren't we going to be disappointed every time the dead thing's just laying there still? At the end of the day, you didn't get your coffee, you didn't get up. You get it? Why are we so disappointed? What do you expect out of something that's dead? 
So aren't we setting ourselves up for disappointment? And ultimately, if we keep attempting the same thing, depression? Consider the following truth. We have, so says the Bible, we believers have been buried with Jesus Christ in His death, Romans 6. That's something for you all to think about. We have been buried with Jesus Christ in His death. We are just asking for depression if we place our fleshly expectations in our sinful flesh, in something that's dead to us. We're just asking for it. It's, it's literally almost, you know, it's like cause and result. If you put your faith in something that's dead, and then you're, you're disappointed because it doesn't happen, uh, and you do that over and over in dysfunction junction, what's going to happen? You're eventually going to be depressed about it because you haven't changed your perspective. You just keep getting more and more disappointed. And how much disappointment can you take before you become depressed? Let's face it, right? Every day, boom, 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 boom. Every day is the same thing. Well, maybe I'm missing something. Just saying, I'm disappointed every day. My life stinks. Does it, though? Does it really? Maybe you should be going to visit the orphans and the widows. Maybe you need a little perspective change. Maybe your life really doesn't stink. Maybe you stink. Do you see what I'm getting at? That's what the Bible says. Humble people live for others. God gives grace to who? Oh, hello? Put those two things together. What do you think then? If you're too self-absorbed and that's your everyday life, that's your living, you just as a self-absorbed person, you're not going to be blessed. That's the point. Who is the least self-absorbed person to ever walk the earth? Jesus Christ. Who had more joy than he did? No one. The least self-absorbed person, the most joy set before him. Sounds obvious to me. And when we depart, he's our prototype, when we depart from that model, we move towards depression. Because that's where we end up. We begin living for ourselves, and then we wonder why we're depressed all the time. Because you're still living for yourself. That's why. You may say, that's not true. You don't know my life. I don't know your life. Let the Spirit work that out with you. Don't take offense with me. I don't know who I'm talking to right now. I mean, I do, but you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of you. You all have your own situations you're dealing with. I can tell you this, though, from Scripture, and this is encouraging, if you want to enjoy the freedom that Christ set you free to enjoy, then you mustn't ever regress into the life you've been delivered from experientially. You mustn't ever regress. If you want to live that life of freedom, don't go back to the dead thing. It's dead. It's just going to disappoint you. And if you expect it not to disappoint you someday, one day it's going to pop up and go, let's do this thing. Let's become a self-made man. Or a self-made woman. We're going to do it now. Mm. You're just going to be disappointed. Go to Romans 6.1. Romans 6.1. But that's what the world keeps telling you. That's what the rappers tell you. That's what the basketball athletes tell you. That's what the rock stars tell you. That's what the actors and actresses tell you. Maybe someday you can be like me. Oh, a miserable wretch? Unbelievable. Romans 6, one. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? It's a rhetorical question. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. This is what's been afforded to you as a believer. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, 
in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. For he who has died is freed from sin, no longer under its dominion or control. That's what that means. He who has died, buried with Christ, is freed from sin. No longer under the dominion or control of something dead. It's dead to you. Well, that's awesome. Well, then why do we keep going back to that well and expecting results? And then when we don't, over time, we get depressed. Again, up here on the board, overcoming death. We have been buried with Jesus in his death. If we are baptized into his death, we ought to identify with it appropriately. Like literally look at your, the, you know, the self-life, the flesh, because we still have our flesh, right? We're new creatures. We identify rightly with our new creature. But we still have a flesh. Who will free me from this body of death? It's dead to us. We need to rightly appropriate what we think of our flesh. We need to understand that it doesn't real, have any real power over us anymore unless we afford it, unless we give it power over us, unless we choose unwisely, unless we begin listening to the world system. But as far as God is concerned, that stuff's dead to you. The fact that we try to reanimate it after we're saved and uh, make something of ourselves is, is folly. But that's what most, I would argue, even many Christians do. And that's part of growing up, I guess. On Thursday, the Spirit used this point to drive home the fact that death is never an easy consideration. It wasn't for Jesus, and it isn't for any of us. But this morning, we are coming at it from a different angle. That is, that we ought to remember that we are dead to sin and its grip over us, which is death itself. For we have been buried with Christ and raised with Him also victorious. Go to 1 Corinthians 15.57. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. See, it's just a change of perspective. If you're down in the dumps and you're depressed, you just need a change of perspective. That's it. If you're a believer, you need a change of perspective. That's why you go to the Bible. You don't go to a self-help manual. You don't go to uh, this or that person for so-called advice. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that in certain circumstances, I guess. But the, your first consult has to be the Word of God. Always. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Up here on the board, some more perspective on that. This means, through our Lord Jesus Christ, this means that victory is not found in any other person other than Jesus. Arrogance claims victory outside of God's precious sanctification. And I kind of alluded to this earlier up here on the board. While it seems kind and encouraging to tell a person they can overcome the throes of spiritual death, you know, misery, anxiety, malcontent, depression, etc. On their own, it is a debilitating lie. It seems, you know, like, you can do it. Yeah, you know, you can do it. Oh, yeah, we're with you. You know, we got this program, and you can do this, and we'll talk about a higher power and all this weird stuff. And we'll lie about God along the way, but you can do it. We're here for each other. You know, this whole thing. No, no. Let's not talk about a higher power, whatever the hell that is, because that's a lie. Oh, you can be a Buddhist. You can be a monk. You can be a Christian. You can be a Jew. You can be a, you name it. It's all the same God. No, it's, no, it's not. There's one true God, and there's the God of this world. Seems kind and encouraging, though, doesn't it? I mean, how dare, how dare I stand behind this pulpit this morning, knowing that some of you have suffered and still suffer with depression? How dare I stand behind this pulpit and pretend to know what I'm talking about when it comes to depression? Some of you are already probably like, yeah, what the hell do you know, mister? I'm serious. I get it. I'm sure that's percolated up in some people's souls. So be it. It's not me you're taking offense with, it's the truth. I mean, it, it proofs in the pudding. I mean, a self-absorbed person would take offense with the vessel. That's what they do. And that's why they're in that condition in the first place. It's the same person. See, this is what true love looks like. It don't lie. I'm not interested in enabling somebody. 
God's not interested in enabling people to live in lies. In dysfunction junction. He wants you out of that. He wants you out of dysfunction junction. This little wheel you're on. Why am I so depressed? Why am I so worn out? Why can't I get ahead of the game? Because you're too focused on yourself. You're not going to the Word of God. You're living a lie. Why can't I get it? This takes us to the end of Thursday's lesson. I don't have audacity, by the way. I have honesty. I have integrity. That's, if you want to take it any other way, fine. But that's, that's, that's what I'll give you. Ask yourself this question. What's worse, to exclude someone from salvation because that's offensive or mean, or to include them destroying the very essence of true saving faith? What's worse? To exclude someone from salvation because that's offensive or mean, or to include them destroying the very essence of true saving faith. Arrogance always chooses the worst possible avenue. This is why when it comes to defending the gospel, we have spent the last year or so dealing with arrogance in so-called Christian ranks up here on the board. This came out at the end of, I think, Tuesday. It came out last Sunday as well as a principle, but then I think Scott sort of highlighted it, and then I highlighted it again on Thursday, and now he's here again on Sunday morning because he wants you to understand what's been coming from this pulpit is not to try to weigh down humble people looking for Christ, honestly, seeking salvation. That is not what this ministry has been about over the last year. It's been focused on arrogance. It's been focused on people who think they can come into a church even and bend God's laws. Even the law of love. I'll tell you what God's love looks like. God loves so much that he lets everybody in through the narrow gate. Because how could a loving God send anybody to the lake of fire? Sound familiar? This is the kind of garbage that's coming from Christian pulpits. We don't have... this, This pulpit has not taken issue with humble people. We might get to that at some later date. And I hope we do, but that's neither here nor there. That's the Spirit's choice. We've always been focused on this issue with arrogant people. So please know this. We aren't witch hunting here. This is not about witch hunting. We're just protecting the purity of the gospel. The good fight. Our fight is with those arrogant enough to skew the gospel to fit their selfish desires. That's what this has been about. For those who have surrendered to the Lord, they ought not be doubting their salvation. This isn't to make you guys insecure even. Some of you were insecure and you got saved since October of 2015, since the so-called gospel reload. Five, to my knowledge, in this congregation. So, isn't that funny how the Spirit works? Our fight is with those arrogant enough to skew the gospel to fit their selfish desires. That's what we have a problem with. That's why Jesus said, I never knew you. Didn't we not prophesy on you? Didn't we not do this? Yeah, I don't know you. Get away from me. But didn't we? Yeah. Didn't we use your name even? Probably. I don't know you. You're a phony. Didn't we sit in church? Yeah, so. Our fight is with those arrogant enough to skew the gospel to fit their selfish desires. For those who have surrendered to the Lord, they ought not be doubting their salvation. The other principle we received at the end of uh, Tuesday's lesson, actually, up here on the board, on the topic of true freedom. If you know you've repented towards God and you've humbly turned to Christ to save you, you can rest in the peace of God. That's Romans 5. God sees the heart. This is the fight we're fighting, though. You understand? This is the fight we're fighting. Arrogant people say, I'll save myself. I'll do it this way. What must I do to achieve eternal life? What must I do? Do you understand the value of that little scene with Jesus, with the rich young ruler? What must I do? It's always what must I do 
to glorify myself because then I can actually take credit for saving myself, for being responsible for being saved even. What must I do? That's arrogance. That's not a humble person. God sees it and he's opposed to that. So says Holy Scripture. That's the fight we've been fighting. I don't want you to think we're witch hunters. I don't want you to think that I'm trying to, you know, we've done a lot of talking about other churches, so-called Christian churches, even called out a few by name. But that's, the, that's God the Holy Spirit's business. He's just saying, here's some examples. This is what's going on in the, our periphery. And if, if you want to just, you know, put on the, the horse sheet or the horse blind is like this, then what are we doing here? What, what does Ephesians 5 say? See it all as truth. Isn't that what we're after? Because everything becomes light when it's revealed. I don't, I, good, bad, or ugly, I just want to know the truth. And I don't want the world telling me how to interpret this Bible. I want the Bible to tell me how to interpret the world. You see, that's what arrogance, arrogance comes through the door and says, I have all these preconceptions and these ideas, and I'm going to impose it on the Word of God. But that's not what God wants. God says, if you, if you abide in this, I'll show you the truth. And the truth will make you free. That's all we're trying to do. There's a lot of people out there that are phonies. And we're actually doing them a big favor, like the five I alluded to, by telling them, hey, listen, you might not be right with God. And finally, the theme we've been hearing from the pulpit up here on the board, and I've got to pick a spot, I guess, to close to God's glory. This life is not about this life, but the next. I mean, if you go your entire life and evangelize one person, was it worth it? If God sends you to Siberia tomorrow, and you have to live in a frozen hut, and you just, you know, you have to learn how to become an ice fisherman, and live off the land, because there's a dude Eskimo next door that you've got to evangelize. Right? If you're able to do it before you croak or freeze to death or whatever happens, is that not worth it? Eternal life, your piddly life. What is this about? Get your perspective right. Oh, no, it's about my new job. About my new ride. <laughs> Picture me rolling. That's what Tammy does. <laughs> Since I don't see it, she goes out of the yard. She... I'm like, I didn't know she listened to rap. None of this is true. I'm sick. This life is not about this life, but the next. Go to uh, 2 Peter 1.10. I'll pick a spot to close. Thank you for bearing with me. I'm going to go lay down for the rest of the day and sleep, pray that I get better because I don't like having fevers. Please, I would appreciate it. 2 Peter 1.10. Second Peter 1.10 Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Huh. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things. You know why? Because Peter loved these people and he had integrity and honesty. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will also be diligent that any time after my departure you will be able to call these things to mind. And I'll close with, I hope you see the Apostle Peter's heart in this passage, and for selfish reasons as well as for reasons regarding your own sanctification. I hope you see mine in it as well. Bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much once again for this tremendous opportunity to fellowship together, to break bread, the very bread of life, the Word of God.
Thank you for giving us the inspired canon of Scripture. Thank you for making it available to us. And thank you for all the spiritual gifts that make a morning like this one even a possibility. We know it's by your, the power of your Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and we are so very grateful, Father. We just ask for your blessings as we take the things we've learned out to a lost and dying world, Father, that needs it so desperately. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. <coughs>